Hi, everyone. Thank you again for joining me. We're going to continue to look at the book of Galatians. And I'm telling you, I love studying the Bible and uh, studying, discovering things, and then passing it on to you. So um, if you know of anybody that is hungry for the Word, just pass this on to them, because we're just going to continually teach and open ourselves up for whatever God wants to show us. And uh, that has brought us to Galatians 3, and we're looking at this idea of salvation. And last week, as I was reviewing the, vi- the, reviewing the video, I made a statement. We are producing spurious believers. And I want to go back and just kind of revisit that a little bit, because uh, it doesn't mean that all the believers that are in churches are, are not real and fake and false, that kind of thing. The idea is that in our desire to show people how simple salvation can be, we want to make it easy. We're, we're, we're saying, we use phrases, you just have to, or all you have to do. And I, I just don't think that is entirely accurate uh, most of the time. So I want to dig through this, but I don't want you to think that I'm saying everything that happens is they're just fake believers. But there are certain things that I think are good for us to review in our process. How do we lead people to Jesus? We, and even with that, we have our, we all have our different nomenclature, you know, getting saved, lead to Jesus, uh, become born again. There's just we use a lot of phrases that people outside the church don't have any idea what we're talking about. And a lot of these phrases we have created. They're not in the Bible. Being born again is in the Bible. But there's a lot of these little catchphrases that we use that aren't actually there. And uh, every once in a while, it's good to review, hey, we're, we're using this language a lot. Are we accurate? Is, is this giving the right picture? So it's never, it's never bad to stop and evaluate what you're, what you're doing. Um, so what I want to do, I'm going to start by reading the first nine verses of Galatians chapter 3. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, you now, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are are the sons of Abraham. Boy, that's that's just a huge statement. And we're going to get to more of that in upcoming sessions. Verse 7, therefore know that that only those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the nations by faith preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. So the emphasis he's making here is faith. And again, I I talked to you the last time. Paul is a key figure here in this transition, moving from a, a Judaistic environment and culture and bringing them into the idea of faith in Christ is the key for everything. When you are in Jesus, you receive it all. And one of these pictures uh, 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 connected to this whole idea of being in Christ, when Abraham entered into a covenant with God, that was Genesis uh, Genesis 15 through 17. So Genesis 15, the picture is God's going to enter into this covenant, and he asked Abraham to get the, the animal pieces, and he, he butchers the animal and lays the pieces out, and he, uh, this is going to be obviously a ceremony that was not uh, foreign to him. I mean, he knew what to do, and then when it was time to enter into the covenant, God knocked him out. So Abraham wasn't even involved in the covenant. And literally, the covenant wasn't with Abraham. But God chose him to pass on the benefits of that. The one that actually went through the animal parts to seal the covenant 
with God the Father was Jesus before he had a body. So in that moment, God the Father entered into a covenant with God the Son, and Jesus became the substitution the substitutionary sacrifice for Abraham. So Abraham received the benefits of the covenant, but the covenant was actually between the Father and the Son, and it's called the everlasting covenant. So then we come to the New Testament, and I'm just skipping ahead. It is the fulfillment of that covenant. The new covenant is the continuation and the wrap-up of the Abrahamic covenant that was entered into by faith. It is the covenant that we get salvation through. So the Father entered into a covenant with the Son, and in the New Testament, when we have faith in the Son, in Jesus Christ, we are, by the Holy Spirit, we are placed in Him, and all the benefits that the Father had agreed to to the Son become ours because we're in Him. We didn't even have to work for it. The Son did the work, entered into this covenant, which would be, uh, if you're a little bit older, uh, you know, we grew up with movies that that were always talking about Indian blood brothers. You know, two Indians make a little cut on their wrist, they put their wrists together, they mingle their blood, and they become blood brothers. Or then they would smoke a peace pipe, or there would be some kind of little ceremony that would exhibit the, the covenant, which meant each party is telling the other, you have all of me. If you ever need anything that I own, you tell me I will give it to you. I'll not withhold anything. Everything that each party had was accessible by the others. That's exactly what happens when we enter into believing in Jesus by faith and have a born-again experience. Everything that the Father said was the Son's becomes ours. We get all the benefits to it. We don't have to work for it. But that was a mystery. The the saints in this first century didn't know that and, and to some degree entered into it by faith and didn't understand it at all. So Paul now is gaining, he's receiving the revelation, the teaching of what actually happened to them, trying to pass it on. And it's just going to take some time. If you think about your own growth, you know, when you first start reading the Bible, there, there's just so much. If you got like a little phrase out of out of four pages, you felt like you felt like you got something. You didn't understand the whole flow of the whole page or chapter to chapter. That comes years later, out of your study, your your hard work. You've spent time in the Word, and you're just starting to gain more and more revelation. It's line upon line, precept upon precept, and over time you just start to gain more and more knowledge of what's actually taking place. You're putting the pieces together. So that's Paul's job now. He's gotten all this new revelation, and he's got to pass it on to these guys. So this church in Galatia, they believed. By faith, they entered into this relationship in Christ. But somebody comes along and says, hey, look, yeah, you can believe in Jesus, but you got to add this other stuff to it you got to get circumcised. You've got to still follow the Old Testament law. You're not saved. So there was a lot of confusion. Is it faith alone, or do I have to do something? Do I have to go to church? Do I have to be in the building? Do I have to tithe? I mean, what is it? Do I have to read my Bible every day? If I skip a day, do I lose my salvation? All these things, they're wrestling with this. <clears throat> so this is, this is the cause for this letter. Paul's writing to these people. This letter of Galatians is going to be uh, carried around to various gatherings, and they're going to read this and study, because at this point, they don't have a New Testament. That's not going to come along for 300 years. They have the Old Testament scriptures, and then they have these letters and documents that are being written by the apostles, so they can try to understand what is happening to us. Something happened inside of me. I know that I'm different, but I don't understand exactly what happened. <clears throat> so that is what, that's what Paul is doing. And he's saying, hey, you began in the Spirit. I mean, the Spirit produced something in you. Now somebody comes along and gives you this teaching, and you, you've walked away from the, the things of the Spirit, and you're, you've gone back to working it out the best you can. And uh, Paul's being tough on them. He doesn't want them to, to fall into and away from the work of the Spirit, which is the essence of salvation. Something happens. 
a new heart is given, there's a transformation. And to feed that, I've got to keep relying on the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> All right. Now, at the end of the last session, I, I brought up a, a couple of terms and I said, hey, I want to talk to you about this belief, faith, and trust. Now, this is, this is a, a theory that I have just from an observation. And uh, to back up my theory, I'm going to take you through some scriptures. I just want you to see that uh, this whole idea of belief, when you start to, to understand how it works and pass it on to somebody else, it's not as simple as, as you would think. It would be simple to, to end up in it, but a little more difficult to really understand what's taking place. All right. Hopefully, hopefully that statement will get clear as we go, go on here. So this, this idea of belief, faith, and trust, I always like to give this illustration of you walk into a room and across the room is a chair. So you look at the chair and you believe correctly that it's a chair. You're looking at it, and you have a belief that it's a chair. Now, you start to think about it. Should I walk over there and sit in that chair? Well, I have to have faith in the fact that that chair can hold me. Well, I believe it's a chair, but now I'm going to exercise my faith. <clears throat> yes, I believe it can, it can hold me if I sit on it. The final step is trust. I have to walk across the room and sit on it. So belief says it's a chair, faith says it'll hold me, but trust goes over and sits in it. And that's a little picture of saving faith. Uh, there's, there are levels of belief, and at times in the church, we make people believe that if they just agree with this, Jesus is God and he died on the cross for your sin. Do you believe that? Yes. Welcome to the family. We have to be careful that someone who's just got a toe in the water, they just, they're just just beginning to understand what's going on, that we don't start to put words in their mouth, and especially that we don't use words that make them think something happened that may not have happened. <clears throat> and as we go on here, I want you to grab a hold of this. You know, I, some of you may have heard the term picking green fruit. Like somebody's not really ready yet to make a full commitment to Jesus and you push them into it, you're picking green fruit. It's not, they're not ripe. They're not ready to be plucked. <clears throat> we have to, we have to, when we want to do proper evangelism, we have to fall into line with the Holy Spirit. We've got to learn how to be led by the Spirit. We say what he wants us to say and no more. We don't allow ourselves to go beyond because we like this person. We want them to be a part of our deal. We want them to be close to us. Uh, and we, being over helpful, we make it sound like it's extremely simple. The Holy Spirit has to bear witness with our spirit. And I want you to listen to these uh, few verses in Romans 8, verses 12 to 17. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if by the Spirit... You put to death the deeds of the body, you'll live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Now listen to this phrase in verse 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, join heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we also may be glorified together." How do I know that I'm born again? The Holy Spirit will tell me. He will bear witness with my spirit that God the Father is now my Father, that I have had a born-again experience. Because until you're born again, you are not a child of God. You are a creation of God, but you're not a child of God. And you'll see that in a moment when we look at another passage. The Holy Spirit has to bear witness with your spirit that you're born again. So if you want to lead someone in the sinner's prayer, that's fine. But now I have to say, let's continue pursuing God, understanding who he is. We'll do some Bible study. And if you really want to follow Jesus, it's time to align your life, your thoughts, attitudes, words, and actions with the word of God. So you need to study the word to see what, what this is 
uh, prescribing as uh, behavior and thought life, and then we're going to allow the Holy Spirit to make changes in us to align with this. That's the process. Jesus didn't say, ask me into your heart. He said, follow me. To follow him means we do what he did. We go where he goes. We just, we're going to now live the life that God would live if he were on this earth. And you say, well, how does that work? Read the Gospels. You can find out Jesus' attitudes and how he lived among people. That's the goal. They're going to have to have a born-again experience in order to become a child of God. But I can't make that happen. So, how does that happen? Let's look at John chapter 3. John chapter 3 is that famous uh, conversation that happened between Jesus and Nicodemus. <clears throat> and I'm going to read, well, let's just start at verse 1 and we'll work our way down through a few of these verses. Uh, Gospel of John chapter 3 verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night. Why by night? Because it's risky. The Pharisees don't like Jesus, so he's got to come to him at night. And said to Jesus, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. So they know that there's something different about him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. Now, now it's interesting. Nicodemus was kind of on another track, and Jesus just cut to the chase. He knows what he's thinking and what he really wants to know. And so Jesus kind of interrupts his thoughts. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one's born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus says to Jesus, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he can't enter, enter the kingdom of God. Now listen to verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And this is the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit has to create the born-again experience in my soul. And that means I am dead and he brings me back to life. It is a new birth that happens within me. Something happens to my spirit. And that's about the best language that I can use to tell you what a born-again experience is. Because it's, it's never completely point-blank explained. You have to draw from it what the transformation is that the Spirit produces through little smatterings all through the New Testament. It gives you a picture of what it means to be born again. You are just, it is a change of heart. You go from darkness to light. You go from death to life. This is, it is something that you only can explain it after it happens. Trying to explain to someone what they need to do to get there, it is a mystery. It is a mystery, and this is why, even this week, just thinking through this, this really would be a, the Reformed faith, uh, people that would be called Calvinists. They put a heavy emphasis in salvation on the hand of God. The rest of us should, too. This is a mysterious thing. All right, verse 7, Jesus says, Don't marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now, this is one of the, like, if you, if you have a tendency to mark verses, that one should be marked. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it. But you can't tell where it comes from or where it goes. When the Spirit of God produces a born-again experience in the heart of a person, you can't tell where he came and where he went. You can't tell how did this happen. Sometimes you can't even tell when it took place. You kind of know around it, but the person that is receiving the, sometimes the, the change that happens, the transformation that happens to them in the moment, it's obvious to them what happened. Other people, it's not as obvious. It's just, it's a mystery. And then you start to ask people how it, how it happened. Some people will tell you, you know, I prayed the sinner's prayer <clears throat> and, and invited Jesus into my life or asked him to be my Savior or put my trust in Christ. I mean, you use the phrase, whatever you want. And 
nothing happened. But then they started going to Bible studies and they kept pursuing God and they were trying to be obedient. And then they may say, you know, but three years later, something happened to me. You know, the bottom fell out in my life and man, something changed inside of me. Well, did praying that prayer back then, it didn't, the answer didn't show up until four years later. Sometimes I think that's what happened to me. I remember when I prayed uh, the sinner's prayer, and it was at a meeting, and uh, I remember looking down at my shirt, and I could see my heart pounding against my shirt, like, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. And and went forward and prayed that prayer, and uh, I wanted something to happen, but nothing happened. There's a, it was like, what happened? It didn't take. You know, did I use the wrong words? Did I say the wrong thing? And then four years later, with no warning, sitting in my living room, all of a sudden, I love the Bible. How did that happen? I don't even know how it happened. I wasn't, I wasn't in a depressed state. Um, I wasn't asking for anything. I hadn't prayed I had people praying for me, but I didn't ask for anything, and something happened to me. I I didn't pursue it. This is the mystery of having a born-again experience. And when did I get born again? I can't tell you. I don't know. I know I am today. I I know that I'm walking with God, and I'm in the Word, and I receive revelation, and I've I've seen His handiwork in my heart, in my life. I've I've witnessed miracles. I've experienced miracles. I've experienced healings. I've I've seen God do stuff. I know that He's at work, and I've grown in my knowledge of what's in the Word. So today, I know that I'm born again because the Spirit said to me, "You are my child," and I knew that I had that experience. That's what you want people that you're trying to reach with the gospel. That's what you want their experience to be. You want to be there to be a person who communicates the truth to them and walk through this and keep praying for them. But when they're going to get birth, you don't know. You don't know when it's going to happen. You may have an idea, but you want them to continue to seek God and uh, align themselves with the word while they're learning how to pray and commune and God gets in the middle of that situation and begins to give them answers. I hope that I'm I'm just communicating this in a semi-understandable way. Because when God moves in a heart, they need help. When you birth a baby, you just don't let it sit on the sidewalk. So usually when babies are birthed, there's a crowd that's around. And then there's somebody that's going to nurse that child and change its dirty diapers and hold it and tell them that they're loved. And just picture everything that happens in a baby's life over the first six months. That's what a a new believer in Jesus needs the same thing. They need that same kind of attention because what's just happened to them, they can't even comprehend. Somebody's got to walk them through all this stuff. Okay. Okay. Is just believing enough? You know, when you read, um, we're looking at John. So listen to John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's one of the first, if you grew up in church, that's one of the first verses you learn. So this says, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Believing leads to everlasting life. But does just believing, is that enough? Now, that's a tricky question. And, and even asking that question, I, you know, I feel like a heretic. But I want you to see that sometimes it's not enough. Uh, John chapter 8. John chapter 8. I want to take you to verse 30. And let's look at a couple of verses here. John 8 verses 30 to 47. As, uh, now, Jesus, in John 8, uh, you look at verse 13 of John 8, it says, The Pharisees therefore said to him, to Jesus. So the Pharisees are talking with Jesus. Verse 14, Jesus answered them. So he's having a conversation now with the Pharisees. And then in verse 21, Jesus said to them again, I'm going away. He's talking to the Pharisees. And you will seek me 
and will die in your sin. Well, that's a pretty bold thing to tell a group of people, but he's letting them know this is your state. And then he just, he goes down through here. There's a few verses and he's just explaining to them, look, this is where I came from. This is what I'm doing. This is where I'm going. Um, Verse 26, I have many things to say and to judge (coughs) concerning, I have many things to say and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true, God the Father, and I speak to the world those things which I heard from him. So Jesus is just saying, look, I'm here and everything that I'm saying, the Father sent me to say. So I want you to know when you have people that you want to reach with the gospel, you need to be so close to the Father that you're hearing his voice. You're, you're saying what he wants you to say. You're just not blabbing. You're under the direction of the Spirit and you are communicating truth that the Father has deposited in your spirit. And out of you comes those words. Jesus is just saying what the Father has asked him to say. So he just goes down through this. Verse 30, as Jesus spoke these words, many believed in him. So as he's just talking about who he is, where he came from, what what he's doing, what, what he's going through, some believed. Okay, that was pretty simple. So now, verse 31, then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, Now, I want you to see, as he spoke these words, many believed in him. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him. So there's something that he said that they believed, and there were some that believed in him. Now, exactly how, who is who in in this next, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But there is a level of belief that's happening here. Verse 32, you shall know the truth, the truth shall make you free. They answered him. We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? The ethnic pride. We are Jewish and there's no way that we're going to hell. We have salvation because of who we are. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you'll be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father and you do what you have seen from your father. See, he's getting to the heart of the matter of what's going on inside of them. They've been trying to kill him. The Pharisees are are out to remove him and to kill him. And they're thinking that they are an in with God because of Abraham. And he's pointing out, no, you're full of sin. Verse 39, they answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you'd do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who's told you the truth, which I heard from God, and Abraham didn't do this. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you'd love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you're not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil. Now listen, he's talking to people who believed. When we started out, many believed in him. And then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, they had a level of belief. But that belief was not saving faith. And Jesus pointed out who their father was. You are of your father, the devil. And he's pointing out what's actually in their heart. This would be a great place for them to say, you're right, have mercy on us. But they don't. They maintain their ethnic pride. They're not going to give this up. I'm fine. One of the problems that you have in communicating the gospel to someone is trying to convince them at times that they're lost, that they need a Savior. It's very hard to communicate to somebody who's a really nice person that they're lost. It's just difficult. All I can do is speak the truth. The Spirit of God has to show them their inability to save themselves. If he doesn't show them, they're not going to understand that. So that's not my job. My job is to just say what the Father wants me to say. The results in their heart is his work. He has to take it and drive it home. And I have to be very careful that I don't start to make it easy. Well, all you have to do is... 
Well, you just need to. I have to be careful not to do it. I have to learn how did Jesus address the lost people. And Ben, every time you see him, he makes them know when he gets in these conversations, usually with the religious leaders, he makes them understand they they are separated from God because of their sin. And if they will allow his word to soak in, changes can start to come. So verse 44, you are of your father the devil and the desires of your father you want to do. <laughs> that quite a statement. He was a murderer from the beginning and doesn't stand in the truth because they're trying to murder him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell you the truth, you don't believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. And that's just getting to the, to the root issue. This is God has to be the one who convinces them that they are lost. But I need to communicate the truth as I follow the lead of the Holy Spirit. I need to be able to speak the truth with some level of love and mercy in my voice. But I need to communicate the truth that they're lost. <clears throat> Okay, now I want you to see in James 2, and these are just, these are passages that begin to show us this, how belief, faith, and trust need to come together so that we don't convince people they're born again when they're not. All right, James chapter 2, let's look, uh, verses 14 to 26. What does it profit, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but doesn't have works? Can faith save him? <laughs> no, I got to tell you, Martin Luther thought that the book of James should not be in the canon. He felt th this book should not be in the Bible because he, he, was, he was the one that said the just shall live by faith. And that scripture shows up three times in the Bible. And when, when he came across this, he felt, hey, this is salvation by works and it shouldn't be here. But as you'll see when we get to the end of this, it's not. But there's something deep here for us to grab a hold of. Uh, verse 15, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and none of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled. And one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled. But you don't give them things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there's one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Even the demons believe and tremble. So believing isn't always a guarantee of salvation. It's a part of it. It's the beginning. It's the front end of it. I've got to move from belief to faith where I believe that it will do this for me. That if I, this is the only source, I have to believe that God can do this for me and I keep pursuing him. It isn't enough just to say I believe because there are people that say I believe in Jesus, I believe in Muhammad, I believe in the universal spirit, spirit I believe in Mother Nature. I just believe everything. Jesus is just one of the bunch. No, this has to be singular. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life to get to the Father. I want to get to the Father. I believe that he can get me there. This is, this, I, it becomes personal. I have to move toward that. So now verse 20, but do you want to know, foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works, faith was made perfect? The scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted him for righteousness, which is right in the passage that I read in, at the beginning in Galatians 3. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise was not Rahab the harlot who also justified, uh, likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is also dead. Now, let me, let me point out to you, and I, some of you are very familiar with this verse, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, 
For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The works that James is talking about proves that faith has come. The works didn't produce faith. But if you say that you have faith and you don't obey God and you don't know the word and you don't walk in this, your faith is dead. Faith should be producing something. Why? Because it's personal. It's gone from just believing this nebulous thing about God to I believe it for me. I have faith that he's carrying me. I have faith that he's going to save me. I have faith that Jesus can get me to the Father. And if you go through If you have that kind of pursuit and the Spirit of God gives you the born-again experience, it will produce a different lifestyle. Your own mother won't know who you are because your thoughts, attitudes, words, words, and actions will change because your heart has been changed. That is what we're after. We're after that. We're after the born-again experience. But we have to properly communicate the truth and trust God to pull that off. In John 6, there were many disciples that were walking after Jesus, and he started saying things to them, and it got to the point where they, they, couldn't, they couldn't hang with it anymore. And it says they, they no longer walked with him. They went back. So these were disciples that said they were disciples. They were following him. <clears throat> but without a born-again experience, you can't keep going. So if somebody says they believe, that's why we want them to follow Jesus, because as we go through this process of leading them and pursuing God on our own, you get to the point where you have a crisis of faith. The bottom falls out. Something happens that you didn't think that was going to happen. In fact, you thought that if I follow Jesus, this will never happen. And all of a sudden, there you are in the middle of it, crushed, falling apart can't believe it. Well, in that moment, when you're face down in the dirt, you have a choice to make. Is God real? Can he pick me up? Can he put strength back in me? Can he put wind back in my sails? Can he resurrect the purpose, the dream, the thing that I know that he put in my heart? Can he do this? Can he? I have a choice to make, and it's all, this is me and God. This is me and God. This is where if I have real faith, something will rise up inside of me. But if I have faith that's dead faith, if I had a, a, a level of belief, but I didn't, I didn't take that step in faith, this is the kind of thing that puts you down and out. This is why people walk away from the ministry. Every year, 6,000 pastors are leaving the ministry because it's hard right now. And the only way that you can maintain this is if you are smack dab in the middle of God's will and you know he can carry me. <clears throat> That's what we want. That's what we want to lead people into. We don't want to make statements that are not true, but we want to let them know the Spirit of God that's in you can do this. And so if the Spirit is, is in them, he will strengthen them and they'll move forward. Or we're there to help them through their crisis. All right, let me finish up by telling you this. <clears throat> these, these, these levels, these are elements of saving faith. The first is belief. John 20 says, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So that first step, why was the book of John, the Gospel of John, written? So that you might believe. It's to to get you to the point where you see Jesus is who he said he is and did what he said he did. The second is faith. The, The definition of faith, the Greek word, means persuasion, to be persuaded. And we looked at that in in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace are you saved through faith. I am persuaded that grace is offering me something and I want it. To take something by faith. You, it picture Jesus actually sitting in the room and he's got a platter and he's saying, here's life. And I'm across the room. This isn't Jesus coming up to me and offering it. This is him offering it. Grace offers it and I see it and faith gets me up out of my chair and I go over and I take it. That's, that's that personal faith that says, I want this thing. The trust. Um, in John 8, 30 and 33, 
I have to read this verse to you because I saw that in my study and it just really grabbed me. Uh, verses John 8, 30 and 31. As Jesus spoke these words, many believed in him. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. That's what we're trying to produce right there. Are you abiding in my word? I want to teach people how to abide in his word. It doesn't mean that I always understand it. But abiding, this word abiding means to stay, continue, dwell, remain, tarry. It's consistency. It's pursuit. It's seeking, seeking, seeking. You don't quit. And in some cases, we can't quit because he did something to me. He did something to me now, and I can't walk away from him. He's, he's all I got. I can't, I can't stop. I have to keep going. I'm, I'm more than halfway across the lake. There's no reason to turn back. And then salvation is a work of God. And I, I really want you to understand that. I hope I've communicated that in some way. But listen to Philippians 1.29. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. There's a couple of good promises. For to you it has been granted to believe in him. There's something about the born-again experience. Yes, we pursue him, but God is involved creating and doing his perfect will inside of that heart that wants more of him. Do you want more of him? Do you want more of him? Pursue him. <clears throat> Go after him. Find him in his word. Become a, a, a student of the word. Every day of your life, ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. Keep, invite him into every situation that you're in. Ask his advice. Uh, talk to him. Tell him you love him. Tell him you're going to follow after him. Uh, it, it's, it's communion. It's depth. But the abiding in his word, this is where we find out what he's really like. And we come after him with all of our heart. <clears throat> Father, thank you for what you're, you're doing inside of us. You're at work in your people. These are days when we have to be full of your spirit. We have to be full of your word. Lord, open up your word. Lead your people. Strengthen us. Make us what you want us to be. And Lord, enable us to, to dwell in in your word, to abide in your word, to tarry in your word, and to stay in there and feed on it, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for instructing us and teaching us. Lord, give us more. Make clear to us what you're asking of us. Fill us with strength and power, and show us the authority and the benefits that we have in this relationship with you, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>